Curtis Mayor and Dean. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, this is going to be an amazing talk. Uh, Keith O'Connor is recognized for spearheading public realm projects that elevate and redefine the value of public spaces in New York and around the world. Having worked in public, nonprofit, and private sectors in a variety of fascinating roles, Keith has recently joined SOM in New York City and a staff of 400 professionals as city design practice leader. He brings more than 20 years of diverse experience leading complex, multidisciplinary planning and urban design projects. In his previous role at the New York City uh, Department of City Planning, as director of Lower Manhattan and chief planner for Manhattan Special Projects, he advanced major public initiatives, including the redevelopment of the World Trade Center site post 9-11, the implementation of the New York Stock Exchange Street State and Security Project, Applied Sciences NYC, the High Line, and the Eastern Valley Art, the Plan the Art. So basically, everything that's important in Manhattan he has stuff for Manhattan. He played a critical role in the World Trade Center redevelopment project during the second and third terms of the Bloomberg administration. Additionally, he was instrumental to ensuring the preservation and revitalization of the High Line's 10th Avenue Spur, shaping plans for the Eastern Rail Yard and Hudson Park and Boulevard, and the implementation of the city's new ambitious East River waterfront esplanade. In his new role, he will lead SOM city design practice in the New York metropolitan region and along the East Coast. He will spearhead research and projects that address the most pressing challenges facing American cities today, including climate change, resilience, mobility, affordability, and equity. Keith started out where you are, sitting in those seats as a CAP grad, uh, graduated with his Bachelor of Landscape Architecture degree before continuing to grad school for a Master of Urban Design. Uh, his class was an interesting and amazing class, uh, and we hope to bring back more of his colleagues over the coming years. We're all doing great things. Uh, so the title of the lecture sheet in the public realm, Urban Regeneration in New York City, Chicago, and Hong Kong, is welcome to keep the comment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Dave. Uh, as Dave said, I, I, I started here. It's actually great to be back at CAP. I haven't been here in a lot of years, so uh, used to sit in those very seats for lectures, although our lectures were later, so you guys sort of have an advantage here. Uh, it's often got dark up top and you might doze off once in a while, so try to keep it lively and entertaining. Um, <clears throat> as Dave said, I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about um, this, this sort of through-line idea of shaping the public realm and do it through a couple different lenses and projects. So one is to talk a little bit about some of my work in New York where I was working at city planning, so in the public sector context and as a representative of the city of New York. Two is um, talking about two different projects that I did while I was a principal at James Corner Field Operations, so a landscape architecture and urban design firm, uh, perhaps best known for uh, designing the High Line, but I'm going to talk about two projects that, that I was involved in, one in Chicago, uh, transformation of Navy Pier, and another one in Hong Kong on the, on the waterfront in Hong Kong. So start in New York. Um, the important thing I think to know as context for this and for looking at the projects is this was 2006 when I'm going to start. So I, I joined city planning in 2006, so this is you know, five years post 9-11. Uh, this is a kind of dramatic and important time in the history of the city of New York and particularly of Lower Manhattan. Um, this is the beginning of the second term of what was eventually a three-term administration under Mayor Bloomberg. Um, and it was really about a, a, a very sort of dynamic and changing neighborhood. So Lower Manhattan, in the scheme of things, is actually an incredibly small area. So it's one square mile. Uh, in the time that I was working there, um, our focus area, which was this one square mile, had this incredible investment of public and private dollars in play. So there was at one point about $30 billion of public and private investment that was being uh, undertaken in that, in that very small geography. Part of it is obviously in response to um, the redevelopment following 9-11 and the World Trade Center, but part of it is part of the continuing sort of evolution of Lower Manhattan. So that first photograph from 1924, where you really sort of see the density and the fabric and what's happening along the waterfront, 
and this a much more recent contemporary photo. So a lot of sort of transformation in that area that had happened over time. A lot of planning, a lot of design work, a lot of thinking. So there's this kind of great tradition, particularly since the mid-60s, with various ambitious plans for the remaking and for the transformation and for the update of Lower Manhattan. The most recent one that was really operative in the time that I was there was this vision. So the mayor had released the vision uh, in 2002. So very soon after, basically just a little bit over a year after the events of 9-11, was this comprehensive vision for the revitalization of Lower Manhattan. And that was not just about rebuilding and redeveloping the World Trade Center. It was a much broader vision for the district. So these four main principles sort of drove the work. One was about strengthening transportation. One piece of it was about commercial development. So there was a massive loss, obviously, of commercial office space on 9-11 in addition to, to uh, the loss of life and, and all the tragedies that happened as part of that. Part of it was about new neighborhoods. So it was part of it was about the transformation of what's happening in, in Lower Manhattan and an increasing uh, residential population. And part of it was about urban design. And the urban design piece, I think, was a really important and interesting piece where there was a leadership statement from the top that the mayor and the deputy mayor and the senior administration officials firmly believed that good design is good economic development. So holding design to a very high level of quality and a high level of caliber of execution and work. This is a map that we had put together, uh, which is really, it's actually a, a sort of a partial map but it's listing a series of projects that were underway as part of this revitalization. So there was federal money coming from uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. So these were community development block grants, about $2 billion in total. And there were allocations to various projects. So the World Trade Center had a major compon component of it. But there was a variety of other projects, some of which I'll highlight here, that got significant federal investment. So it wasn't just about rebuilding the 16-acre site of the World Trade Center. It was about a broader revitalization of Lower Manhattan. I'll start with World Trade Center. So as you probably know, uh, 16 acres was, was essentially the footprint of the World Trade Center. As you probably know, before what was built in the, in the 70s had been destroyed, it was a super block, totally discontinuous from the rest of Lower Manhattan. And one of the important principles, there were sort of two or three fundamental drivers to the redevelopment. One was to reintegrate World Trade Center into Lower Manhattan. So what you see here is the, uh, the stitching together, this block structure, streets and sidewalks reintroducing Fulton Street, which is this one, first paved river to river street in Lower Manhattan, and Greenwich Street, bringing those two streets actually back through the site in a way that they hadn't existed in decades. The second piece of it was a decision to, to preserve the footprint of where the trade towers were. So that eight acres, so eight acres of the 16 acres was reserved for the memorial. And that was a fundamental decision that then pushed the development to the perimeter. And then the third idea was really about public realm. It was about stitching together the streets, the sidewalks, and the memorial into a cohesive and integrated public realm. So huge number of players in this. So I was on, on behalf of the city and working at the Department of City Planning. There was the construct for this, which was the master plan that Daniel Liebskin had developed with a set of principles that was the original armature. There were a variety of pieces. Uh, Michael Arad and Peter Walker partners were partnering doing the actual memorial itself. There's a pavilion in the middle of it designed by Snowheda. There was an original iteration of the Performing Arts Center designed by Frank Gehry in his office, which is now being realized by, by Rex. So changes of design and ownership uh, throughout the project. The Streets and Sidewalks was, a, was an EDAW AECOM collaboration looking at that public realm. And then there was a retail component. Different architects for the different buildings. So one of the things we were doing as part of the public realm uh, was trying to shape parameters for the redevelopment as well. So there was a whole set of detailed commercial design guidelines that were setting parameters for the way that the buildings would work as an overall composition. So we were interested not only in how do you codify and how do you adhere from a regulatory perspective, exert influence on these buildings, on the skyline, on the composition of these as a cohesive whole, 
um, but also to the elements. So thinking about the integration of the World Trade Center transportation hub. So this is Calatrava design, sort of known as the Oculus, but thinking about it not just as a piece of architecture and as a piece of sculpture and as this sort of wonderful addition to the civic armature that is New York, but also thinking about it as a transportation hub and how, that's, how that fits in and links to the city. And then taking it all the way down to a very high level of detail. So the city was actually involved. We were sort of engaged in the discourse about the streets and sidewalks, right? Literally down to paving details, type of stone, jointing, patterns, finishes, all of that, again, driven by this idea, this principle of reintegrating World Trade Center into Lower Manhattan. And so making decisions on that based not just on a design aspiration, but on a set of principles. What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to actually do here? The memorial itself, uh, again, Michael Arad and Peter Walker partners were collaborating on the design of the memorial and the plaza. And a big piece of our work was not just looking at and thinking through the details of the memorial. So everything about the, the, the texture and the quality of the paving to the dimension and the scale of the benches, right? Where this is a seating element and because it's a memorial, we purposefully have the, the elevation of those stones a little bit lower than is comfortable for a normal seating dimension so that you're not lingering as you would in a public park. But there's a place to sit and a place for respite, but it's really more of a pause because it's about being respectful to the memorial. Or pragmatic things like lighting of the plaza and the integration of, of security infrastructure and cameras and trying to do that in the, in the least obtrusive way. And so really participating in, a, in, I think, a very kind of nuanced and sophisticated dialogue about those elements to make sure that the original vision, the idea that Michael and Peter and the firms had about the expression of the memorial, and simple things um, that in the design were clear and evident about the expression, but in reality were incredibly difficult. So the, the difficulties of taking what would otherwise be the state DOT jurisdiction or the city DOT jurisdiction and left to their own devices, that memorial would be surrounded by a standard New York City sidewalk, five by five concrete cast sidewalk. And being able to try to take the designer's vision and work through our own regulatory processes to simply allow this very basic simple principle of curb to curb expression of the memorial. The work that we did to try and make sure that those trees there were actually viable, that they, that they weren't made in, uh, unviable by utility conflicts, by subgrade infrastructure, to actually allow there to be enough soil volume to plant those trees to have that expression of a memorial grove. So those were some of the kinds of things that we were looking at, that we were working on, that we were trying to advance. Another project that we worked on Again, on the east side, so uh, I mentioned Fulton Street, river to river, Hudson River to East River, was this incredible complex, this, this intersection of Fulton and Nassau Street. So this incredible concentration of historic resources, all of these old commercial and mercantile buildings um, that really had an incredible architectural character. Uh, all kinds of different periods and styles and quality uh, in this historic district sitting at this intersection. And one of the things that had happened is over time, um, particularly at street level retail, uh, there'd been a lot of interventions that, that really did not contribute to or support the architectural character and quality of the streetscape. So as part of the redevelopment, we actually invented a program that people could participate in and get funding to support updates and renovations. So we had a set of design guidelines focusing on retail and store frontage. Um, we actually set up a, a, a set of principles to understand how we could upgrade and reinforce and enhance and emphasize the architectural quality and people would actually participate in those programs and get public funding to help support those renovations and updates. So part of the program was about buildings and architecture and storefront. Part of it was about streetscape rebuilding sidewalks and public roads and upgrading utilities. And part of it was about open space. So it was the combination of these three things that was about servicing the lower Manhattan population, both the commercial worker sector, so about 380,000 public employees working in lower Manhattan, 
and servicing an increasing and growing residential population. So a series of new open spaces. This was one that David Rockwell designed. Uh, actually did it as a, as a civic gesture of goodwill. Donated all the design services and created from a existing parking lot this great new imagination playground. So it was all about a new idea of play and interaction and taking something in, in a historic district and providing this new amenity to a growing residential population. These were a couple of the other open spaces, again, sort of in a string along Fulton Street. Um, new open spaces, pretty simple. Trees, benches, paving, but something that was high quality, something that was green, something that didn't previously exist in that neighborhood. New York Stock Exchange. So uh, a major piece, and you probably remember this, after 9-11, uh, stock Exchange was actually closed for about four or five days. Um, and one of the things that the city was very cognizant of was a fear after 9-11 that businesses, financial services sector, insurance industry, real estate industry, would decamp, would leave Lower Manhattan. And so what we were trying to do was instill a degree of confidence and to create um, a commitment on behalf of the public to the quality of that environment. So part of it was security. So stock exchange sits right in the middle there. That's the stock exchange. And this is the perimeter that was essentially established around the stock exchange. Immediately after 9-11, NYPD came out, dropped big concrete barriers in the streets. They literally parked. You can see the police car and that, that red pickup truck. They filled the trucks with sand and cobbles to make them heavy, and they drive back and forth and create a kind of barrier. And so part of the project was to say, is there something we can do urbanistically that provides this security function, but does it in a more amenitized way, in a way that fits in with the streetscape? So it was this idea, uh, this was a project led by Rogers Marvel Architects, to combine these kind of three ideas, the Jersey barriers, these big concrete planters, which people usually put out put a big heavy thing in the way, and came up with this idea of a, of a no-go. So a heavy concrete, but a, but a sculpted element, something that sits in the landscape. And basically took each of these intersections, created a highly functional, so for those of you in the, in the security know, uh, oops, sorry, that's a, that's a sally port configuration, right? So you open the front end, you let a vehicle in, you close it, vehicle can't go anywhere, you do your inspection, when it's cleared, you open the back end, they proceed through. So this was an idea about creating something that sat in this kind of incredibly important urban environment. This is a classic view, literally looking down Wall Street at Trinity Church, and on the left, some of the temporary installations of these clamshell devices, and on the right, what the team had come up with, which was a turntable device, not unlike what's used in, in, in theater or, or for uh, you know, switching in rail cars. Uh, a turntable device that had these robust physical elements on them, but they were a part of the urban landscape that had, a, that had a design to them, that had a materiality to them, that really kind of served as an amenity and not just security infrastructure. At Wall Street, so right in front of Federal Hall, uh, so the original capital before U.S. Capitol went to D.C. was in New York. That's a statue of George Washington who took the original oath of office there. And subtle things like the pattern of the paving right in front of federal halls in a radial pattern that radiates out from the statue of George Washington. You can see in the, in the lower part of the image here, these little squares in the sidewalk are actually wood block paving to mark Wall Street is named for what was a historic wood stockade. So sort of marking that interpretive element in the sidewalk, telling some of the story of the history of New York. Or on the right-hand side, uh, this, this curb element, which was Broad Street. Broad Street is broad in New York because it used to be a canal from, from New Amsterdam. So having some of those interpretive elements designed into simple things like paving and streets and sidewalks. And then the last one I want to touch on is East River Waterfront Esplanade. So this was, this was the biggest, what we called, off-site allocation. So $150 million, not dedicated to World Trade Center, but dedicated to waterfront access. Um, this was all about creating connectivity. This was all about creating amenity. This was all about getting people to the waterfront. So making these series of cross-grain connections from the financial district, 
from the Fulton Street corridor, from the Lower East Side, from Chinatown, all of these connections that bring people down to the waterfront and then in a linear way along the waterfront while amenitizing it. So this is, this is what we had. I mean, sort of not a, not a proud picture um, under the elevated FDR drive. We had parking lots, including for buses and trash trucks. So you literally couldn't either see or physically get to the waterfront. Uh, we weren't utilizing that waterfront. We weren't capitalizing on it. And this project was all about remediating those issues. So this was a, <coughs> excuse me, this was a project led by shop architects and Ken Smith, landscape architects, and a, in a collaborative and team effort. These are images of a number of the improvements. So there were Esplanade improvements. There were a number of piers that were provided to be upgraded. There were upland connections and plazas that brought people to the waterfront that were part of this project. And this is an image, um, I think this actually is opening day of the creation of this new landscape, paving, furniture, plantings, amenities, and these sort of great framed views and physical access to the waterfront. So again, a whole range of details. It's a relatively narrow site, so trying to amenitize that edge, actually doing things like in the bottom right, creating this kind of bar stool high level seating at the railing, right? Literally taking what otherwise is a six inch railing and it leans out and it leans in and it gets wider. So you can sit there and work on your laptop or have lunch and look over the waterfront. Um, playing with the grain of the wood and the slatting and the seating elements. Playing on the top right on uh, an integrated lighting feature. So we painted the east face girder of the FDR and bounced light off it. And again, you know, part of my role on behalf of the public sector was this design team had a great idea, right? This sort of lavender line, this beautiful, poetic, wonderful thing. And it turns out that paint is not a capitally eligible expense. So we as the city, we're going to say to the design team, the thing you've designed, which is beautiful and elegant and poetic and actually the least expensive thing, we can't actually pay for. So we need a more expensive system so that we can adhere to our procurement and funding things. And so that was part of my role, I think, as a public sector was working with the design team, not just to push and advance and elevate the design, but to defend it and to hold on to it and make it pragmatic, to actually be able to realize these great things that they had come up with. This was a feature uh, al alternatively known as a, as a get down or a lookout that actually brought people lower and got them closer to the waterfront. Again, something that we had a tremendous amount uh, of time and effort and energy put into to try and realize for various reasons that I won't get into. But, but you know, this amazing moment of elevated infrastructure in the FDR drive, this activated and animated waterfront at the edge, and the integration of plantings and lighting and seating and all of these kind of public amenities, not just as park and open space, but as part of a civic commitment on behalf of the city to say to businesses and residents, this is a place we care about, this is something we're committed to, this is something that's gonna be high quality and amenitized, and we wanna instill confidence in people in lower Manhattan post 9-11. So a range of projects, others which I won't get into tonight, but I think this, this, this sort of idea about the role of the public sector in shaping the public realm not just for the purposes of great public space, but for this broader aspiration that had everything to do with instilling confidence, economic development, and really sort of recovery from uh, the traumatic events of 9-11. Talk a little bit about Chicago. So this was a project that I did while a principal at James Corner Field Operations. So this was actually being more active on the design side as opposed to my role working for the city. Um, and it was as much about civic aspiration as anything. Um, so what you may know and probably sort of recognize but was very evident to us in working on this project is our client was Navy Pier Inc., NPI, which was a purpose-created organization that was a subset of the MPEA, the Metropolitan Pier and Exposition Authority, which is the authority that runs McCormick Place. So they run McCormick Place, they run Navy Pier, but because they're in the convention center business, that's how they think about it, that's what they do. And one of the things that was really interesting to us is when we got involved, um, it was one of these projects that was driven by an aspiration, not by a pressing need. So Navy Pier 
was and is the most visited tourist attraction in all of the Midwest, eight to nine million people a year. People are coming, it's fine, it's successful. But Millennium Park was a game changer. Millennium Park changed everything in Chicago and in the dialogue about public realm. So you have leadership at a major institution in Chicago uh, who has a, a, a product and a place that isn't up to the same level of caliber as something like Millennium Park, which is this real point of civic pride. So you've got Navy Pier, which has a great and long history uh, of, of being this sort of wonderful civic public investment, right? One of the two main piers that was envisioned in the original Burnham plan, built in 1916, getting ready to celebrate its 100th year, grand civic architecture that over time had become something very different. Um, and was, again, people are coming, it's successful, they visit, but really didn't have the same level of quality of caliber. And so that was the assignment, was really to sort of elevate Navy Pier to this point of civic pride again. And so field operations actually entered, a, there was an international design competition. Uh, field operations was the winner of that and developed an overall vision and then, and then executed a number of projects. So, you know, it's a massive site. I'm sure probably everybody in this room has, has been there. Um, you know it, you recognize it. And there were a few things that sort of drove our design. One was about integrating the city and the pier in a more cohesive uh, and, and closely linked way. Part of it was about greening the pier, bringing some of the park and open space and greenery that was in Gateway Park out onto the pier. Um, and part of it was a kind of systematic addressing of all of these issues and deficiencies and sort of linking this into a cohesive public realm. So the, the, the structures on the pier, these pavilions and these kiosks that service for food and for vending and for the, the tour boats, uh, the furniture and the sort of integration of those elements in a well-designed way, the plantings, the greenery, the horticulture, uh, and the paving, the surface, literally the sort of texture of what you experience. So a couple before and after shots, uh, you know, really taking the primary colors that were, that were evident in so many of the um, festival marketplace environments, so Boston Faneuil Hall, South Street Seaport in New York, Baltimore's Inner Harbor, Chicago's Navy Pier, they're all the same kind of language, and as, as you probably know, all literally designed by the same firm over time, um, and really kind of changing that and bringing that up to a more contemporary standard. So bringing greenery out onto the pier, changing and upgrading the architecture, um, this whole notion about pulling the, the language and the axes from the city out onto the pier and reinforcing that. Um, we did a lot of work to bring greenery and to, to bring plantings out onto the pier, including literally cutting giant holes in this 100-year-old uh, pier so that we could get in robust soil volume so that we could have that serve as part of the stormwater management system that we could make sure that these trees that we're bringing out onto the pier are going to be robust and vital into the future. Um, we worked as part of a big team. Field operations was actually the lead on this, but we had a huge team of consultants from lighting to signage to civil engineering to horticulture to architecture. So N Architects out of Brooklyn, New York worked with us on this feature called the Wave Wall, which was all about mitigating the grade change between South Dock and Pier Park in this great sort of undulating, wonderful sort of feature that blended inside and out and that transitioned these upper and lower levels of the pier. So, a few views of the wave wall, both as a sculptural and articulate element, as a place for public gathering. So this is where everybody kind of sits and watches the fireworks. Simple things that we did like, before we got involved, there were, there were boats all stacked up along the pier. So if you went there, you could walk half the distance out on the pier and never actually see the lake because your view is blocked by all of these boats that are parked there. So actually taking an area and creating a zone where that's open and accessible and you can have an open view to the waterfront. So this, this kind of very simple thing, but that became an important driving principle about the experience of going to the pier and being on the lake. You know, I think we had a bit of an advantage coming from New York that you, you, you go, you get used to it, you guys get used to it, you go there. I mean, Lake Michigan is extraordinary. It's amazing. Um, and really wanting people to see and feel and understand that and that be a visceral part of the experience. Letting people actually get up to the edge. There was a 
six-foot utility trench. You couldn't actually get to the edge of the pier. And so silly and sort of stupid and pragmatic things, but like redesigning the utility trench and putting in a grate and putting an edge that actually invites and allows people to get to the waterfront edge and to do that in a way that is safe and accessible and appropriate. Um, this play, and architects had this great idea about sort of folding the, the roof of these lake pavilions, as they called them. So this is aggregating ticketing and food service, having it under a canopy, which provides some shade, which is important in the heat of summer, reflecting the water and the color and the movement and the animation. All of these kind of simple things, but I think executed at a very high level uh, of resolution. A great new water feature. So if you had been there, there was a sort of big box that was not accessible. That was an old water feature that WET had designed. It was programmed. It was cool. It was interesting, but it was not interactive. And so this fundamentally different approach to a water feature, which is very interactive. So um, different levels of animation and articulation, fun and accessible to kids, this kind of dramatic nighttime lighting, fog, mist, jets, all of these kind of things really being this sort of wonderful new addition to Gateway Park. Um, and the articulation of, of, of classic sort of features of landscape design and, and the obsession about the detailing, whether it's, whether it's a step or an ADA access ramp or a bench or a planter or the paving, really is just sort of paying a lot of attention to the, to the detail and the materiality uh, and the resolution of those things. Again, this is that, that edge that I talked about, this utility, whoops, keep pressing on the button, sorry. This utility great edge um, and, and, and dealing with that and designing that as an important part of the overall landscape design, something that's very pragmatic, um, something that's very practical, but really treating it with a degree of, of care and attention. Lighting and nighttime and the sort of drama of that. So we worked with a great team, Le uh, who's done sort of wonderful lighting and the character and quality of that nighttime environment and really being very conscious of that and the way that it plays out. So again, sort of an interesting one for me to think about an institution, a nonprofit institution who is motivated by elevating their asset to a level of civic pride, of integrating that public realm, of capitalizing and taking advantage of some of the great uh, cultural anchors that are at Navy Pier, the Children's Museum and the Shakespeare Theater and, and some of those places and sort of how they interact with that, um, that, that sort of great civic armature. Hong Kong. This is interesting for me. Um, it's a private initiative private company that wanted to redevelop a major waterfront project. And <clears throat> this was, again, this a project with, uh, with field operations. Uh, it was a small competition that we, or small as in not many people, uh, competition that we won. Um, 12 acres, public realm, right on the waterfront in Kowloon. So if you've been, this is the picture postcard view of the skyline of the island of Hong Kong. Our site is the place from which all of these photographs are taken. So this is the southern edge of the Kowloon Peninsula, the TST, the Chim Chow Choi waterfront, um, that all of this sort of remarkable phenomena of the Hong Kong skyline, the nightly um, laser light show, if, if you've seen it and been there, that's put on. Um, this is the site from which all of that happens. So the Star Ferry Terminal on the west side, the Avenue of Stars, which is Hong Kong's sort of equivalent of the Hollywood Walk of Fame, uh, the Art Museum, the Cultural Center, and our, and our client's piece, which was this New World Development site. And so they were interested in a major new mixed-use development, but they were also interested in a public realm, an upgraded and enhanced public realm, which is, I had not worked there before, uh, it was new to me, but, but that is a, that's a sort of radical concept in, in Hong Kong to sort of focus on high quality public realm. So we had the opportunity to analyze and to evaluate and make a set of recommendations on redoing this Avenue of Stars and Salisbury Garden, which is this piece over here. Um, not unlike Navy Pier, it's popular. People come there. You can see the view. You, you could sort of, you could do almost anything, including literally put up barricades to try and keep people away, and they'd still come. Doesn't mean it's a great place. Doesn't mean it's high quality. So it's hot, 
packed, it's crowded, there's virtually no amenities, you can't actually get to the edge. So the, the uh, Queen Victoria Harbor is one of the world's great harbors and there's just a fantastic um, array of, of cruise boats and working waterfront and it's difficult to actually get to the waterfront. Not to mention, um, when we started, it was in pretty deplorable condition, so it needed to be rebuilt. So part of this was an evaluation that says, well, what, what can we actually do and how can we address this? So it's a relatively limited footprint that we were given. It's existing over water coverage, inaccessible edge. Uh, because people pack two and three and four deep at the edge to, watch, to look at the skyline and to watch the show, uh, it's actually difficult to see. You get sort of back a few rows. So we have this principle that says, how can, we, how can we play up that? Can we get people actually closer to the edge? Can we enhance the views? Can we create subtle changes in level? Can we give different perspectives to, to look at and to view the harbor and the skyline? Um, and part of this became a very important analytical undertaking. There's people who, regardless of its condition, didn't like change, didn't want to change. It's something that's been there forever. And so this kind of analysis of talking about what the changes that we're proposing would actually do and how it would actually enhance transparency and why they should consider making those modifications. We originally wanted to expand the footprint. We wanted to build out. We wanted to increase the, uh, the space available for, for public realm. Um, and eventually we weren't allowed to do so from a regulatory perspective. No new overwater coverage. So, but trying to hold on to that concept and that edge and doing dozens of iterations to try and figure out can we eke out a few more feet? Can we build a little bit more capacity? And can we do that in a sympathetic and designed way? So on the one hand, these, these highly refined details about the angle and the view of transparency, the dimension of access at the edge, and on the other hand, this big move and this sort of diagram of what does this mean for this one and a half kilometer waterfront and how is that playing out as a broader system? And so this is the, the vision that we eventually came up with, with a new revitalized Avenue of Stars, uh, the mixed-use development, the New World Center, which actually is in the process of opening right now. Um, this is one of the viewpoints. So this, this kind of sculpted edge, these amenities, shade structures, seating, plantings, greenery, this sort of sculpted uh, edge and experience, this terrace level where we have benches and seating at different height to get at that kind of baseline diagram of improving and enhancing the experience of people at the edge. This, this you know, incredible view, this undulating uh, railing and this, and this sort of scalloped edge playing on, on, on the wave action and the movement in the harbor. Um, these overhead trellises, these fantastic things that, you know, again, we as, as landscape architects designed and modeled in the studio and had a fantastic and amazing team of structural engineers who helped to realize our vision. So, you know, an aspiration that we were actually able to realize in a, in a high degree uh, of specificity. Playing this through, again, in, in dimension, in strategy, in diagram, and being utterly obsessed about trying to realize that big aspiration and that vision. So, building these things in, in, in 3D model and making the arguments with the client, public and private. Um, thinking about the lighting and integrating lighting into these elements that a lot of this is about how you view that edge from the waterfront and from across the harbor and really wanted to play up that uh, dramatic nighttime view. Um, and then literally, you know, physical models, half-scale models, full-size mock-ups, paying a lot of attention to the, the, the materiality, the texture, the color, the tone, the finish, uh, and on the bottom, one of the construction installation photos that is actually in the process of being realized. At Salisbury Garden was all about bringing people to the waterfront, sort of an open, generous public space, which is something they really don't have in Hong Kong. Um, this was one of, I, I, it's one of the things that I'm, that I'm probably most proud of because if you look at this, I think this is a plan and a diagram, has a real clarity and, and has a simplicity to it. The number of physical utility and regulatory impediments to realizing anything that looked like it had even uh, an ounce of design effort was extraordinary. So this was one of those projects where we spent you know, 5%, 10% of the time generating an idea and 90% of the time, energy and effort defending it and trying to realize it and trying to keep it from being 
utterly, completely annihilated. Um, but it being all about this incredible thing about coming down from Kowloon and actually seeing and experiencing the waterfront, which wasn't always the case, and in fact was blocked for much of its history. So, so having this civic space, um, again, playing that out, celebrating that with this kind of great waterfront canopy that provides a, a stage set and a viewing port uh, platform and a kind of spatial definition. Um, and the image, I, I, I will admit, I'm always blown away, but the image on the left is an actual photograph, which to me still looks like the model. Um, but that's it built and realized. So sort of registering that physicality of the environment in a very kind of clean and clear way. Um, and, and doing it in a way that accommodates art and sculpture and creativity, wrapping these very pragmatic utility buildings, which is all kinds of things coming up from below, and making them an architectural statement. And having a landscape architecture team lead a vision that really is in many ways about architecture and facade and expression. Um, but it really being about that, that, that sentiment and that sensibility about the public realm. Um, and again, sort of a view of that. So this, this great sort of wonderful, I think, public realm space and experience that brings people to the waterfront, that helps facilitate that viewing. It just opened a couple weeks ago. Um, it's gotten, I think, some, you know, some, some great reviews. It's, it's one of these wonderful things that I think we as, as designers always sort of hope for. We have a couple images um, that are our renderings, and then the photograph, including we did the rendering just like this. This is a photograph actually from our client uh, that I think was so sort of meaningful to see, for me to see the sentiment expressed about what it means to design public space and to be involved in that kind of discourse and involved in the, the realization of projects of this kind of magnitude and effort and complexity and sort of what that does and what that contributes uh, to the public environment. So New York post 9-11, Chicago Navy Pier transformation, Chim Chow Choi waterfront in Hong Kong, that I think are very different contexts, very different clients, but what I think is sort of consistent and uniform and runs through it is this commitment to a level of quality, this interest in, this, this recognition of the value of public open space, uh, the importance of the big idea, the diagram, the relationship that you're trying to achieve, and then just a relentless obsession, I think, to the things that, that drive probably all of us in this room uh, about realizing design at a very high level of character and quality. Thank you. So, so we, have a, we have a few minutes. If there are questions, I'd be happy to, to try to answer them or to talk about more if anybody has questions. Yes. What's, what's new on the horizon? What's new on the horizon? Um, a number of things. So I, my, my new position, I'm actually relatively newly at uh, SOM, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, as Dave said in the introduction, in New York, running the East Coast design practice. So that's New York and DC. Um, and, our, and, a, and a piece of it is really sort of reinvigorating that practice. Um, with a focus domestically. So we actually are doing and do a lot of international work um, places around the world, but increasingly really trying to sort of refocus some of our efforts on the public realm and the urban environment in New York. So we're doing things like uh, working with our transportation division on improvements to Penn Station, which as we all know desperately, desperately needs it. So mul multifaceted aspects of that. Um, we increasingly at SOM have been doing work on transformational campus planning. So probably the, the best known was actually an outgrowth of a project that I worked on back when I was at the city, which was Cornell Technion. So this is the new Cornell Tech campus on Roosevelt Island that SOM uh, did the master plan and served as, as master architect on. We're actually doing a very similar thing right now for Princeton University. Um, so working on that. And then interestingly, just in the last um, two weeks, there was a major announcement that the de Blasio administration made on climate resiliency. So they unveiled a new $10 billion proposal to protect the financial district and seaport in lower Manhattan from a range of climate risks, um, including storm surge and rising sea level and tides, 
uh, by building out, continuing the sort of grand tradition of building in Lower Manhattan and expanding the landmass by building out into the East River. So it's something that's just sort of come out. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major new announcement. It's, it's variously, I think, embraced um, and, and in some cases sort of dismissed as a, as a crazy pipe dream, but a really, a really kind of dramatic idea about what does it mean and what does the science tell us about what's going to happen in the next 25 and 75 and 50 years and what are we going to do about this sort of major area of you know, 400 years of habitation that is at profound risk and, and how are we as a, as a city and a society going to respond. Yes. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting because um, in many, it, it, right, it's a, it's, a, it's a profoundly sort of different geography and climate, and there's an aspect of it that's actually a very interesting dynamic because, um, you know, our, our Hong Kong client came to visit us in New York, and we took them around and sort of toured them around the waterfront, and they said, like, this is, you know, this is amazing, extraordinary, and we, we, we could never do anything like this. And part of our lesson to them was to say, you know, this is, this is recent. You know, 15 years ago in New York, that didn't exist. We didn't have public realm on the waterfront. We didn't have high quality. We didn't have any of these greenways and parks and plazas and open spaces at the perimeter. That's all a relatively recent phenomenon. So there's this connection of you know, looking from afar to, to other places, but New York in particular for a quality of open space and wanting to aspire to it. And then it's so much about the translation of appropriateness, right? So there's actually a great desire to have, uh, everybody wants a Bryant Park, a big open lawn. Uh, and you can see we actually, we have one in, in Salisbury Garden. But in Hong Kong and in the climate, that's not a particularly good idea. And so there's this translation of the way that people use and occupy and enjoy open space that I think is, is the real um, cultural and geographic representation. So one of the things we were always focused on is, is trying to articulate very clearly what the principles are that create effective open space and then making the translation as opposed to copying aesthetics and materials and scale and sort of saying that's, that's not, you don't, you don't just want to take that and replicate it. And that was a, you know, as you can imagine, that was a phenomena that we faced all the time having uh, field operations having designed the High Line I don't know, seven of 10, eight of 10 clients come to field operations and say, I want a high line. You know, can we, we, we have this thing, we want to sort of create a new one. And, and part of that dialogue always being to say, from our perspective, what's important about it is taking your unique asset. In New York's case, it happened to be an elevated rail line. In other cities, it's a, it's a different thing. Um, treating it with respect and admiration and having something be place specific as opposed to those peel up benches are really cool, we love those planks, let's, let's get some of those. And so I think it becomes this, this very interesting dialogue about trying to ground public open space in the traditions and the geography and the aesthetics and the use patterns of that particular place and culture. And, and for me, that opportunity to sort of be working in New York and Chicago and Hong Kong at the same time was a, was a very sort of enriching opportunity to sort of um, play that out in these very different contexts at the same time. Yes? What role participatory design has in big, big large scale, big idea projects? For instance, when you talk about the uh, lower, the Fulton Street area, and you talk about building an opportunity for people to buy in, to redesigning their storefronts and so forth, was there any input from, you know, the small business owners and so forth? Yeah. It's a, it's a great question, and Fulton Nassau is a really interesting one because um, there's a particular dynamic that plays out. So most of those stores are owned and run by people who don't own the buildings. And so the buildings are absentee landowners. Uh, and you can see it from the image. 
because the, the demographic for that is predominantly public workers, people on civil servant salaries, there's a conscientious effort to have an aesthetic and an expression that is affordable, that's inexpensive. So trying to convince people actually to upgrade their storefronts in some conditions was, was against their sort of business model. They're like, I, I, my actually storefront kind of needs to, I need to look like a, it's kind of a rundown place and people b believe it's, it's sort of inexpensive. So it was, it was literally, we had a consultant team that was engaged. We went door to door. Uh, we had a team of people who knew every owner, every worker, their family's backstory, who were literally doing this, this sort of hand-to-hand -hand, uh, retail level of outreach and trying to help facilitate that and trying to say, look, all we're trying to do is help make an investment and an upgrade, uh, not, not, not to change who you are or what your business is, so a very conscientious effort to say, we love the shoe repair shop, we love the locksmith, we have no interest in sort of pushing you guys out and getting more upscale or different businesses. It's all about trying to create a little bit more clarity and legibility and accessibility. Um, so we did, it, we did it with the store owners, we did it with the building owners. There's a great sort of armature in New York called community boards. So there's 56 community districts and community boards throughout the city that are citizen participation. And so you, you go and you meet with them, you have outreach, you have engagement. So there's a fairly robust armature in New York for participation. Again, it's all, it's all um, elective and, and volunteer. Um, so it's always, it's always a hard thing. It was interesting on, a, on that East River Waterfront project. We stopped counting after having done 120 community meetings. Um, but even at that level, you'd inevitably go out for your 131st public community meeting and have people who say, this is the first time I've heard of it. I don't know anything about this project. Why are you, why are you doing this? So, I think part of it is just about that, that kind of constant, continual, um, iterative process of, allow, of giving people a voice, of giving an opportunity, but also trying to actually sort of move forward with executing and realizing on some of these, particularly some of these ambitious projects. You, we'll come back to you. You already have one. Many of them are. I mean, what was so interesting about it, so I, I just have to give you context, because it blew my mind. We had three levels of involvement. So the city of New York would show up, and at the lowest level, there was an incentive, $15,000 worth of physical improvements to your security grate, to your signage, and to your awning. No cost to you. So city of New York will pay $15,000 worth of physical improvements, will pay for all of the architecture and engineering services and all of the permitting and approval services. You just have to agree to do it. $60,000 worth of effort on your storefront. So the glazing, the door, the window frame, sort of doing that, that retail at a two to one match. Two public dollars for every one private dollar. And if you were treating your entire facade, you could get up to $150,000 worth of value, physical improvements plus architecture, engineering, permitting. Even at those levels of incentive, it was incredibly difficult to get people to participate. So we had some success. We, had, we updated the shoe repair and the locksmith and the eyeglass and probably, I don't know, probably two, two dozen storefronts where they're there, they're still there. We sort of achieved, I think, the, the project objectives. Um, interestingly, the other thing that happened is the private marketplace, by and large, did a lot of what we were hoping to do. So in places where there were vacant storefronts or where there was turnover, there started to be this level of um, expression, not regulated, but, but just sort of a kind of character and quality that started to be realized throughout the district. So uh, it was a really interesting sort of project and, and, and lesson for me, I think, on balancing the financial incentives, which in this case were incredibly significant, with the underlying dynamics of businesses, ownership, participation. I mean, some people just, you know, it's going to take time. To, I'm going to, I'm not, my business is going to be closed while I'm sort of fixing my facade. And for some folks, sort of operating right on the edge of solvency, even something like that can be incredibly disruptive.
That's a great question. I don't think no one's ever asked. Um, I I don't know. I feel like it, uh, I, I feel like I have been incredibly fortunate in having had opportunities in in each of those realms to um, to be to to be effective. Um, I I sort of got super lucky. I think in my trajectory of you know, being in the public sector when I was, which I, I hadn't done any work there. I was there at a particular time where design and urban design in New York was highly valued and where there was this incredible opportunity to bring to bear my knowledge and skill sets and sort of apply it in a, in a context where it was needed and valued. And, and that's not, it's not necessarily been the case before and it's not necessarily the case after, but I, I sort of happened to hit that, that sweet spot. Um, I think for me at field operations, the, the, the same thing. Uh, you know, I came to the firm uh, you know, with, I guess, about 15 years of experience. So I was, I was coming out at a more senior level and I think could contribute to and could oversee uh, design in a way that I can make contributions at a leadership level and as a principal in the firm um, at a level of resolution that, honestly, I probably never could have done earlier in my career as a, as a sort of designer, as a drafts person, as sitting there. I mean, the, the caliber of people that we had sitting in that office just in terms of pure design sensibility and productivity was far and away uh, above what, what, what I've ever been able to do or could, it, could do. But I felt like I could make contributions in helping to realize projects and thinking through how do, how do we take this great and amazing thing that you've sculpted and actually realize it. I mean, that, I was saying to a, to a, saw a colleague the other day um, who we worked very closely on that, on that waterfront project in Hong Kong. And I said, literally, that sculptural cladding, uh, every time we drew it, every time we modeled it, every time we have a meeting, I thought, this is the one. This is it. Value engineered. We're, we're, it's never going to be ripped. There's no way anyone's ever actually going to build that. And to see something like that actually realized, and again, I think that was part of what what I did and part of what our team did was, was continuing to sort of build and explain and justify why we needed to do that and why that was important and, and why that, that, that sculpting, that, uh, that design expression was so important and would make such a contribution. So I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think I've just been super fortunate in, in sort of falling into the right place at the right time where I feel like I have been able to make a meaningful contribution in, in very different contexts. In a, in a nonprofit context, in a in a public service context, and in a you know traditional landscape architecture and urban design firm. Did you mention that you were working on the Hudson Yards project before? I did. So when I uh, when I was at the city, I was part of a team that was um, that was working on the zoning parameters for. Hudson Yards, so Eastern and Western Rail Yards. Um, if you've been tracking it, Eastern Rail Yards is sort of the piece that just opened recently as this sort of massive new development. Um, so I was involved in that uh, early on, um, in part focused on a, a, a piece of the High Line that was initially proposed for demolition. So it's a very interesting dynamic that you had, you know, the High Line overall originally, which was proposed to be demolished, and then was, was saved and repurposed, and I think everybody sort of sees it now and says, how could you even have contemplated that? But, but interestingly, um, you know, 10 years in, there were thoughts and proposals after the great success of that to say we have this other piece of it that's kind of an annoyance and kind of in the way, and it would make the redevelopment of this project much, much better if we just got rid of it. And so I was part of the team on the city side that was tasked with trying to find a way and a construct to allow the development to proceed and to ensure the preservation and adaptive reuse of that section of the High Line as part of the 10th Avenue spur. The vessel. Well, man, that's a tough question. Um, it's, you know, it was a really interesting perspective because the, um, the vessel is something that I think couldn't and was, couldn't be and wasn't contemplated. So, 
having worked on the zoning framework and parameter, uh, we had to wrestle with a couple of difficult things. Uh, one of which was immediately south of the vessel is the Diller Scafidio Renfro and Rockwell Design shed. Well, zoning doesn't really contemplate buildings that move, I and mean, that's kind of not a concept, so figuring out how to deal with that. Um, and something of the scale and magnitude of the vessel, which is not a building, which is arguably a sculpture, um, I think is something that we had never contemplated. So on the city side, I think we had a, had a vision for Hudson Yards, which is an incredible level of density and mixed-use development, um, and an aspiration for a significant piece of open space. So the High Line being part of it, 10th Avenue Spur being part of it, and a kind of central open space being part of it, which, which is now um, occupied, uh, appropriated in some fashion by, by the vessel. So um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think it, it's a, I mean, Th Thomas Heatherwick is, is sort of an, an amazing and extraordinary designer and does sort of wonderful um, sculptural work. The, the piece as a piece of art and urban phenomena, I think, is quite extraordinary and, and sort of um, poetic. Um, personally, from my perspective, I'm, I'm not sure it's necessarily in the right place or at the right scale for the rest of the density and for all the other things that are happening around it for the, the architecture and the range of, of buildings and, you know, very significant retail mall and the shed as the moving building. There's a lot happening in that one space. Um, I mean, the one thing that I would say, and it's, it's, it's true on that whole western segment, is there's this extraordinary parameter which again, New York City as a public policy sort of put in place, which has said we want to we want to reclaim, we want to create development platform over rail yards, and we, the public sector, we're not paying for any of it, right? So we asked private developers, in some cases, to spend a billion, a billion and a half, two billion dollars, to get ground on which they could then start to build. So. To incentivize that, to, someone to, get, to, to, to have someone take that kind of risk, to literally spend a billion and a half dollars before you can start spending another billion and a half dollars to build your building to eventually lease it up and, and make some financial return is a, is a, you know, is a, is a tall order and a real um, challenge, I think, to sort of get the right balance. All right, well, listen, if, if other people want to chat, I'll hang out, we can talk, but otherwise, thank you guys all. Great to be here.